From tweets of 280 characters to an hour and a half long speech, Donald Trump delivers his first formal address to Congress. But how well was it received? I'm Imran Garda, and today's newsmaker is the State of the Union. Donald Trump had a lot on his plate, and in a speech that ran a full hour and a half, he got a lot off his chest. Watched by millions around the world, the Republican leader covered everything from ordering Guantanamo Bay to remain open to the perceived threat of North Korea. But unsurprisingly, a Russian investigation wasn't on his agenda. Trump's speech praised the country's economic success and went on to offer an open hand to work with the Democrats. But division between the parties has never been worse, especially when it comes to the issue of immigration. For more, here's Natalie Pohonen. There was a rousing reception from Republicans for Donald Trump at his first State of the Union address. The man who brought the mottos Make America Great Again and America First to the White House was keen to promote that agenda to Congress. The state of our union is strong because our people are strong. This, in fact, is our new American moment. There has never been a better time to start living the American dream. Trump's script hailed the work of his administration to bring in tax cuts, create jobs, boost trade, and fight Daesh. He announced he would keep open the Guantanamo Bay detention facility and once again called out North Korea and its nuclear ambitions. But there was little mention of China or Russia and none at all of the investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election. During his speech, there was a clear divide in the room along party lines. But that didn't stop the president from calling for bipartisanship. I call upon all of us to set aside our differences, to seek out common ground, and to summon the unity we need to deliver for the people. This is really the key. And the issue he wants and needs support for from both Republicans and Democrats is immigration reform. Under the current broken system, a single immigrant can bring in virtually unlimited numbers of distant relatives. Under our plan, we focus on the immediate family. Under our plan, we focus on the immediate family by limiting sponsorships to spouses and minor children. The president says he wants to protect the American dream because Americans a dream is too. But it's clear not everyone in this house shares his vision. Natalie Pohonen, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Washington is Joel Rubin. He's a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State. Also in Washington, D.C. is Niall Gardner. He's a director at the Heritage Foundation, specializing in the Anglo-American relationship. And finally, in Ann Arbor, we have Aaron Call. He's a political commentator and the director of debate at the University of Michigan. I thank you all for joining us. Let me ask you, Niall, to begin with. Uh, Donald Trump was, by some measures, a little bit restrained. He still boasted a bit and he was listing his achievements over the past year. Does he have enough achievements over the past year to back up that speech? Well, absolutely he does, and I think it's been a tremendous year for the United States in terms of the growth of the U.S. economy, reducing unemployment, uh, soaring stock market. Uh, I think you've seen a huge amount of uh, regulation swept away that has restricted uh, the success of businesses in the past. This is a pro-free market uh, agenda that uh, President Trump has advanced. And I think most Americans are benefiting from this uh, free market, low tax um, agenda, actually. But also, on the world stage as well, I do think you have a far more proactive US foreign policy. Uh, you've seen ISIS almost completely eradicated in Iraq and Syria. I think you see a, a far more aggressive approach being taken uh, towards the Islamist threat, but also uh, I think the United States has taken a very tough stance towards Iran, Russia, North Korea, 
and a whole range of okay. adversaries. And okay. so, so you have seen, uh, I think, a very robust approach taken by the US on the world okay. stage. So well. you've listed a bunch of things that, that he had listed and, and you feel it's all positive and warranted. Economy, foreign policy, immigration. Let's separate these out a little bit. On the economy, Joel Rubin, Trump himself said, since the election, we have created more than 2.4 million new jobs and unemployment claims have hit a 45-year low. Can't argue with that, can you? No, and, and he should have congratulated President Obama for having created this uh, economic environment that we're all enjoying and benefiting from. And, uh, uh, but he didn't, and, and that's not a surprise. I think that uh, when we're looking at the economy overall, though, there was a paradox last night, which is that uh, President Trump essentially uh, got a tax bill through Congress that will raise our debt overall by $1.5 trillion. Uh, and this is uh, with a party that was opposing debt uh, not in the not-too-recent uh, a past. So uh, we're going to have a lot more burden on our workers and our families coming up very soon. Uh, state and local governments are deeply troubled by the tax bill. And the booming stock market, while it is significant, it doesn't really uh, get felt by the American working class in terms of their daily life and daily income. Right. And wage stagnation is real. And the president didn't list any uh, steps on how to change that dynamic. Okay, this is interesting. Aaron Cole, might they both be right? Might it have started with Obama? Is it blooming with Trump? And that there are some question marks over the tax bill. Might they both be right? Yeah, there's always a, a middle ground uh, to be sought. But I think the highlighting of some of the economic issues was uh, a good part of the speech last night. I thought it was a little bit disingenuous to talk about economic data, especially as it related to job creation after the election, as opposed to when he uh, began the presidency in January. But um, a lot of the, the numbers do support his policies, but I feel that my main criticism of the speech was that it went on for so long, by the end of the speech, you had forgotten about some of the uh, positive things that the administration's done too long. An hour and 20 minutes in, in today's kind of media environment is just too long for people to, to stick around. I thought he recognized too many people in the, uh, in the crowd, and that took away from his administration's message, which does want to claim credit for a good economy in his last year in office. Yeah, well, it was too much for Luis Gutierrez, the Democratic congressman from Illinois. He walked out of it. It wasn't because it was, it was too long. He wasn't very happy with what he was hearing. Let me, let me ask you, Joel, about foreign policy then. So North Korea talking tough and some emotional moments as well. Uh, Otto Warmbier's parents there, he was tortured and eventually died, you know, uh, at the hands of the North Koreans. Talking tough for North Korea, blaming Obama for Abu Bakr Baghdadi and ISIS and so forth. Has he done okay on foreign policy? And even as a Democrat, maybe you have to admit that he hasn't done so bad. Well, I, I think that we have to uh, disentangle this. There is no doubt that the American people support protecting American human rights and, and uh, advocating for Americans imprisoned abroad. The Obama administration also uh, got the release of many Americans who were wrongly imprisoned, be it in, in North Korea, in, in, uh, in Iran, and elsewhere. Uh, but when it comes to foreign policy, there is a paradox. Just last night, the, the, the expert who uh, Trump, uh, President Trump was going to nominate to be the U.S. ambassador to South Korea quit, saying that the policy is no good. And so the president is laying the groundwork potentially for military action with North Korea. Uh, it called for a significant increase in defense spending without any uh, concern about budget impacts, and also called for increasing our nuclear arsenal, while at the same time ignoring the number one attack against the United States in the last uh, year or so, which is the cyber attack by Russia. He didn't even right. mention that in terms of Russia's uh, in, in invasion of our democratic process. So uh, there's a lot of dissonance there. I don't think that he's going to get the support that he thinks he's going to get on starting a war with, with North Korea. Nile Gardner, a huge Russian elephant or Russian bear in the room, maybe? Well, yeah, I, mean, I, I agree that uh, Russia should have been the subject of very strong condemnation in the State of the Union uh, address. So the president should have directly uh, spoken about the menace that Russia poses, not only to U.S. democracy, but also, of course, to, uh, to the free world as a whole especially in Eastern Europe. And uh, I think it's important, though, to recognize that the overall U.S. Um, approach towards Russia has been very robust. You've seen the rebuilding of U.S. military might in Eastern Europe. You've seen a decision by the Trump administration to send defensive weapons to Ukraine. You've seen an overall strengthening of the sanctions against Moscow. So the Trump administration's approach towards Russia has been very, very tough. But I would like to see the president personally confronting Vladimir uh, Putin 
and also insisting upon uh, the Russian withdrawal from Crimea and an end to its proxy war uh, in Ukraine. So the Russians are our adversary, our enemy at this time, and they should be aggressively confronted. Aaron Cole, has it been easy to figure out his foreign policy? I mean, so we've got what he listed as his successors, but more than one year on, has it been easy to figure out what exactly the policy is and whether it's consistent uh, in terms of a general broader strategy? No, it's been a little bit of a mixed bag, and it's you know not surprising you know, given his lack of political experience, you know, military experience. One of the, uh, the only I think the president we've had kind of facing that the same exact uh, scenario. And and I do agree that the news breaking about the South Korean um, ambassador just before the speech was was not good. And I think a lot of people would have liked to see more of a, a talk about Russia. I think looking back in history, in 2002, when President Bush kind of you know penned the phrase "axis of evil." If there ends up being a military conflict between the United States. And um, in North Korea, you know, people will look to this speech and, you know, kind of that ominous tone is potentially uh, being a part of it. But I do think the president did a good job of compartmentalizing Russia and the scandals surrounding him. Not mentioning it was very smart and similar to what President Clinton did in the late 1990s, as opposed to Richard Nixon, who in 1974 called for the end of the investigation. So to yeah. tout your success and not talk about scandal is, is the way to go in these kind of speeches. Yeah. Joe Rubin. Immigration reform was a big part of the speech, well, right? Well, okay, fair enough. No, just chime in. Yeah. Yes. Come in. Yes. Come in. Immigration, we'll please. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, no, I was I was also going to mention that uh, uh, one uh, very significant uh, statement that the president made that does gather a lot of attention around the world, particularly in the Middle East, is that he wants to continue to keep Guantanamo Bay detention yes. facility open. Uh, that flies in the face of previous American presidents from both parties. Uh, Senator John McCain, a leading hawk in the U.S. Senate, Republican, calls for closing Guantanamo. There are only 41 detainees, and he signed an executive order to keep it open uh, without any clear rationale as to why. And I do think that the fight against terrorism by the United States right now uh, is missing key information. We're not engaging our regional allies. We're not engaging uh, Turkey. We're not engaging the government uh, of Iraq. We're not dealing with regional uh, uh, sensitive issues about the internal political dynamics in Iraq and in Syria. And uh, calling for the opening of Guantanamo just right. demonstrates its own deafness that, that okay. really makes it harder. Yeah, that's a good point. So, Niall, maybe that's a sign when he says he wants Guantanamo Bay to be open, even though leading hawks, even on the Republican side, want it closed. Is it a sign that maybe it's less about keeping America secure and just more about being anything that Obama was not? Guantanamo, of course, is open now and it's going to continue to be uh, open. Uh, and uh, there is overwhelming Republican support for keeping Guantanamo in place. There's also overwhelming public support for that as well. And the reality is that uh, the, uh, the detention facilities at Guantanamo Bay uh, are effective in terms of uh, enhancing American security. And under the Obama administration, far too many terrorists were released from Guantanamo. They went back onto the battlefield uh, fighting against the United States. Uh, and so, you know, you simply cannot allow that to happen. I, I, the I'm reality sorry, is Niall. The national that, that, security I can't strategy let that stand. of I can't let the current that stand. U.S. administration is very, very, is, no. is very robust and strong. No, that's absolutely, that's absolutely true. The Obama administration released dozens of terrorists no, who were, should not have been no, freed. No, that was from they the Bush administration. They should have remained in Guantanamo. They then went on to fight against and the, kill Americans. The recidivism uh, issues that you're referring to were from releases during the Bush administration. And, and, and uh, there is no national security value that simply in continuing isn't true a detention all. facility that, that, that costs millions false. of dollars per individual. You see Guantanamo as an issue is, is think, uh, clearly you know, a, a hot-button issue. The important, uh, the, the important thing to remember here is that the last eight years uh, the Obama administration was in charge, an awful lot of prisoners from Guantanamo were released by President Obama, uh, and they went on to, uh, to re-offend and to uh, take up arms against the United States. That, that is the reality. Guantanamo does serve the U.S. national interest, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, it's going to be uh, remaining in place for many years, if not decades to come. Okay, so, Joel, final response to that before I move on to immigration, Joel. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I respect the debate, but uh, Guantanamo across the board, former national security leaders from both parties, military leaders, Senator John McCain, Condoleezza Rice, President George W. Bush, all have said that it is on net a negative for American national security and it should be closed. Okay, clearly opinions differ on Guantanamo Bay. Aaron Cole, let me bring you in to talk about immigration here because Trump in many ways puts it front and center. It's connected to many things. It's connected to the wall that he wants to build. He speaks about drugs and gangs coming from the South. For some, that's the unvarnished truth. For others, he's just, he's just a racist, right? Does it, all the attention that he's giving to immigration and immigration reform, does it warrant it? Does it need to be that much of a priority, do you think? Not in the speech. I thought that was actually the low point of last night um, because it was, you know, the most divisive issue. It's obviously an elephant in the room, and you have to discuss it, especially because as it relates to the original, the government shutdown, and then also the, the upcoming February deadline for a potential sequel of that. But it was very clear by both reactions to the room that there was not going to be any consensus on this issue. And I, I think there's a very small chance of getting any significant deal done since we have midterm elections in November. And I thought the, the line about some Americans being dreamers was a cheap shot. And then using uh, some invited guests with uh, who were victims of MS-13 is, is something that was tried in the recent Virginia elections and, and rejected by the public. And so I think uh, talking about the issue would have been smart, but the way in which it divided both the audience watching and those in the chamber, I thought uh, really detracted from his overall message of the speech, which was unity and bringing the country together. Niall Gardner, the most divisive part of the speech, maybe on immigration, further dividing Congress and the American people? No, I completely uh, disagree, actually. I think some of the most powerful moments uh, of the State of the Union address um, focused upon the tremendously negative impact of illegal immigration on the United States. Uh, and I think the president was right to highlight atrocities carried out by uh, illegal immigrants, uh, in this case in the form of the MS-13 uh, gang. I thought it was a very powerful uh, moment, actually. Uh, and the reality is, I, I think, that uh, you know, illegal immigration is not a benefit for the United States. And the president spoke about the American people as being uh, the real dreamers here. And so I think it's right for the president to focus upon protecting America's interests, its national security, and ensuring that all immigrants of this country follow the rule of law, just as they would be expected to do so in any European country uh, as well. And so uh, I thought the overall message of the, uh, the president was, was right on immigration. I, I don't believe, though, in the idea of granting amnesty to 1.8 million illegal immigrants. I, I don't think that is uh, something that uh, is going to be widely supported uh, among U.S. Uh, conservatives. Uh, and, uh, but I think the overall big picture message on immigration was the right one, which is that you have to have an immigration system uh, that uh, basically brings on board those people who have skills, who can contribute to, uh, to the United States, instead of sort of blanket uh, approaches through the visa lottery or a tolerance for uh, illegal immigration. Uh, right. So I think we do need to see a new approach taken by uh, the, the United States that more closely mirrors uh, most other uh, countries in the Western world. Okay, so Joe Rubin, let me ask you a double barrel question in response to that. First, give me your response as to whether you agree with Niall and think that Trump got it right on this. I suspect you don't. And then also, tell me whether you think Democrats and Republicans will actually find a way to compromise on this issue, particularly with regards to DACA and so on. Thank you. Yeah, no, the immigration statements last night were very offensive to those who believe in the American dream and in the American ideal of us being a country that welcomes immigrants. Uh, my family came here several generations ago. I can't tell you of any family that I know that did not immigrate here at some point or another. And so what the president has done is conflated many issues into one. He's essentially saying that all immigrants are MS-13. Well, that's not accurate. I want MS-13 off the street. I think that we should go after them. Clearly, that is a, a danger, but not all immigrants are MS-13. Uh, for example, uh, Salvadorans, El Salvadoran immigrants who live in the Washington, D.C. area by the hundreds of thousands, they're also victims of MS-13. But last night, they felt like they were described as MS-13, mm -hmm. and that's not right. 
and it's not American. Uh, in terms of the legislation, we do have real significant issues, but the comprehensive approach has not been debated or discussed. There was an immigration bill several years ago talking about a pathway to citizenship. It was bipartisan. Lindsey Graham and Marco Rubio, senior Republican senators, were leading on their side of the aisle with Democrats. That fell away. Uh, it has not been resuscitated. And the president is sort of using the uh, uh, dreamer group subset of immigrants who were brought here as children by through no fault of their own as a, a leverage tactic to uh, obtain extractions, including related to what uh, is called chain migration, which is actually family reunification. Uh, the president got here through uh, 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 migration that was generous, and now it seems like he wants to reduce that generosity. But I don't think it's very uh, uh, generous to just allow one to bring in their brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers. Uh, that's what they're talking about repealing. So there are real gaps. And my fear is that mixing all this together will make a deal impossible, rather than just focusing on border security mm -hmm. and the dreamers, which would potentially create some type of compromise. Well, OK, gentlemen. Unfortunately, I've got to move on. But it's been good straddling some of these issues and chewing on you know, the economy, on foreign policy, on immigration, and just taking stock in many ways. It's an opportunity for us to take stock uh, as to where Trump is right now and where the United States is. It's been a pleasure talking to all of you on the Newsmakers. Niall Gardner, Joel Rubin, and Aaron Cole. Thanks again. Still to come on the Newsmakers, Kenya's main opposition leader holds his own inauguration. But will the mock swearing in further divide an already divided nation? And we asked Pakistan's former foreign minister, Hina Rabbani Khar, if her country supported the Taliban while she was in office. Welcome back to the Newsmakers. He's calling himself the People's President. Kenya's main opposition leader, Raila Odinga, held a swearing-in ceremony for himself. It comes after October's controversial election rerun, in which Uhuru Kenyatta won a second presidential term. But Odinga boycotted that poll and rejected the result, saying it was impossible to stage a credible election. The two rivals do not see eye to eye, and this latest bit of political theater is sure to have angered the current government. But with tensions in Kenya already running high, what will President Kenyatta's next move be? Here's Vanessa Keneally. It's been on the cards for weeks. Laila Amolo Ortega in full realization of the high calling assumed the office of the people's president. A swearing in, in style only, in which Kenya's opposition leader becomes what he calls the alternative president. The event held at a park in central Nairobi was attended by 15,000 Odinga supporters, many of whom travelled from the poorer parts of the country. At times things were tense, at others totally silent as the government ordered TV stations not to televise the ceremony, threatening to shut down and revoke the licences of anyone who broadcast it. The good thing is that uh, we have social media, which we're not using. And that is a very big tool to get information nowadays, because mainstream media has always been compromised. Why is it that when uh, Raila Molo Odinga is being sworn in, uh, all the media services are shut down, while the people who stole the election were being sworn in, everything was shown worldwide? The ceremony is in no way legally binding and felt more like an elaborate publicity stunt than an inauguration. But it's attracted attention to the political tension that's been swirling around East Africa's biggest economy for months. It developed after President Uhuru Kenyatta won 98% of votes in a rerun election in October, making him leader for another five years. Odinga pulled out of that second election, saying those in charge had failed to implement the same kind of checks and balances they had during the first vote in August, which Kenyatta narrowly won. 
Odinga had planned to hold this kind of inauguration ceremony in December, but postponed it until now after advice from both inside Kenya and abroad. He's had a colourful career, having been jailed for trying to stage a coup, holding the post of Prime Minister in 2008, and the record for the Kenyan politician who has changed allegiances the most times. And now some believe October's election was Odinga's last stab at the presidency because he's 73. His supporters say he was robbed of that same title in 2007 in an election that deteriorated into nationwide ethnic violence and left 1,300 people dead, while 600,000 others fled their homes. And given that Kenya is now more polarised and divided than at any time since then, there's concern that history could repeat itself. Vanessa Keneally, The Newsmakers. Well, to discuss this, I'm joined from Nairobi by Joseph Ikuya Simeka. He's a member of Raila Odinga's National Super Alliance Party, or NASA. Thanks so much for joining us, Joseph. So, there was this... It's my, it's my pleasure, thank you, yes. ...alternative swearing in, and your leader calls himself the people's president, but in reality, he's not. Isn't he being a bit reckless right now with the political future of Kenya? He didn't call himself, you know, um, that's erroneous. People to keep saying that he called himself or that he swore himself in. Suddenly he did not call himself. It is the people who recognize him because they elected him. So you cannot purport to call yourself a people's president. It's people who can confer that honor to you. But he didn't elect So we cannot talk about they didn't reckless, elect him. recklessness. Yes, no, but, go ahead. but they didn't elect him. You didn't compete the, in that second round. You didn't the, compete in that second round. And they did elect him. They, they did elect him. The second round you're talking about, you know, is absolutely right. an election that is completely disputed, which we do not recognize as an, a legitimate election. So, if you agreed that there was a second election and you trusted the Supreme Court enough for their recommendations to hold a second election, what I'm saying now is if you believe this man's your president, why not compete, win it, and then you can call him the president, and then you can say, this is truly the people's president. We do not agree and do not recognize that there was any second election. You will remember very well, I suppose, if you follow Kenyan politics, that there was a change of the, the law and the rules midstream in the, middle, in the middle of an election process. So when that happens and when you get intelligence that um, what happened on the 8th of August is going to happen again and even in a worse way, it's absolutely useless to purport to participate in any such flawed process. Hence, the withdrawal and the demand that we must secure the process first mm -hmm. before anyone who wants to compete in that process participates. Okay, so certainly. But what you're doing doesn't seem to be wanting to secure the process. What you're doing is saying, well, never mind this, this election thing then. We'll just be the winners. And Kenyatta's fans can say he's the winner and the country is split in two. How is that a democracy? You are mixing the time frames. We insisted on securing the process before the repeat election. By the way, we agreed to a repeat election. We were totally happy with the decision of the Supreme Court and agreed to a repeat election until the other side began to change the rules in parliament, intimidate the judiciary, and begin to put in place a, a, a process to rig the way they done on the 8th of August. His deputy, Kalonzo Musioka was not at the event. What does that suggest? That while you might be on side with Odinga, maybe he's not? Maybe he doesn't agree with this swearing in? He doesn't have to agree. He has given his reasons, though, why he wasn't there. He alleges that he was held by the police. We do not know that. We don't have those, the facts yet. We are waiting for the facts to come in. But nevertheless, whether he was held or not, whether he voluntarily chose to stay away will not change the resolve of the Kenyan people that what we need is a legitimate process. Okay. So, you know, revolutions and um, processes of, uh, of reform always have a way of defining and separate, separating leaders from uh, opportunists. So uh, time will tell whether what he's saying is true or not. Okay, so let's bring in David Murati now. He's the vice chairman of the ruling Jubilee Party. It's great to have you on the program for the position that comes from the ruling party and the alternate view. What we've been hearing is a passionate response from Joseph Simeka, Simeka, Simeka saying, listen, 
there wasn't a fair process. We don't recognize it. We want a fair process down the line, but for the moment, our true leader is Raila Odinga. Tell me why you disagree with that. Simeka is uh, living Alice in Wonderland, eh? Because there was an election on the 26th of August. They did not participate in that election. The August 8th election was annulled, null and voided for the presidential. So they cannot keep talking about the August 8th election. The election that will go down. You mean October in the 26th? Just, is to, be, just August, to be clear. Uh, October 26th. Yes. yes. Yes, that's the election that will go down in uh, history as an election that was upheld by the Supreme Court. And that is the election they boycotted. They went to court to nullify the August 8th election when it was decided by the Supreme Court do an election within 60 days, they boycotted. That was a court order. They were actually in contempt of court by failing to mm -hmm. appear on the 26th of October. Mr. Murati, can I ask you why if Number they two. are not... A, uh, just, a, just a second, if you'll allow me to come in here, because I want to, have, I want to get a bit of a debate between the two uh, of you here. If they're not that much of a threat and they're living in Alice in Wonderland, as you say, David, why did the state clamp down on the media? It wasn't just state media, but it was also privately owned media that was barred from actually covering the swearing in. If Kenya is a free democracy and Uhuru Kenyatta was democratically elected in October, why do you fear them so much that you're actually blacking them out when it comes to their alternative events? The media is up and running. The national broadcaster is running. Uh, Media Max is running. There was a conspiracy between the NTV and Citizen TV. They were in cahoots with the NASA people. And if you want to remember the issues that brought about genocide in Rwanda, it was because of irresponsible media. So when we think that the media is being used to excite and to incite the population, government has a responsibility to maintain law and order. Okay. Now, when you don't give these people airtime, the country is calm. Okay, but so let me ask Joseph Simeka. Okay. Live broadcast okay, you made the point well. Yeah. So let me ask Joseph Simeka. Yeah? Joseph Simeka, are you Go ahead. inciting yes. violence? by your events and by what you're saying, by refusing to accept the legitimate president of Kenya. And that's why they have to shut you down. That is the, just a fiction of Murade's imagination and, uh, and his colleagues in, uh, in Jubilee. Uh, when he talks about the media running, and he, actually I'm happy he names MediaMax and uh, the national broadcaster. MediaMax is owned by the Kenyatta family, so that's why it's running. The national broadcaster, they are, you know, they, because they are holding hostage in uh, institutions of state, that's why it is still running. But we have laws that regulate the media in Kenya. If you have any reason to believe that any media house is going to break the law or is breaking the law, you must resort to law to limit its freedoms. And our constitution says the only way you can limit any right of freedom is through written legislation, not, not f presidential fiat not through, not arbitrarily. So I disagree completely, and they are doing this because you put it very well, they are totally afraid. They're scared of us. That's why they are doing this. They're scared of us telling the truth. David Murati, are you afraid of them? We are not afraid of these people. Let me tell you, these guys, by the way, <laughs> that swearing in was an non-event. It, 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 it was just like uh, any other rally which they've been holding in the streets. When you talk about swearing in, the people's president. You know, remember, Raila was not sworn in as a president of the Republic of Kenya. He was sworn in as a people's president in uh, funny assemblies. When you talk about swearing in a president, you're talking about the instruments of power. After they saw Raila in, he went home to his wife. The other people went home to their jobs. What president, what kind of a president? In fact, we chose to ignore and not even to engage them. After all, you cannot be afraid of people who have no instruments of power. How? Well, they want power. Let me ask you then, Joseph, what's the next step? So you had your event. It uh -huh. was heavy on symbolism. But as David says, short on substance, because Odinga went home to his family and everybody else 
went home as if they attended a rally. So you want power. Tell me what's your next step after the swearing in. But first of all, you must hold him accountable. You don't let him, let him get away with this. He does acknowledge now. He changes. First of all, he says we wanted to incite people to violence, like Rwanda. Then suddenly he changes and says it was a non-event. It was nothing. How do you, why are you afraid of a non-event? How does a non-event incite people? So you, need, you don't let him get away with that. You hold him accountable for well, that. Well, that's why we have you a debate. You can see so, how they keep shifting okay. their position. Okay, so fair enough. You made a good Thank point. Thank you. But let so me shift to the, the question okay, you so asked. Wait, wait. Hold on for yeah, a second. Yeah. The, David, respond to that. On the one hand, on the one hand, they're going to create Rwanda and genocide. That's why you have to shut them down. On the other hand, it's a non-event. <laughs> how do you square the contradiction? Fair point Absolutely. from Joseph. You can address Absolutely. that, David. Yeah. There is absolutely no contradiction. The reason it was not an event is because they did not achieve their objective. The reason they did not achieve their objective is because, number one, we withdrew the police and they wanted a confrontation with the police and we made sure there was going to be no riots, there was no confrontation. That is what made it a non-event. If it had been broadcast widely, most of the speakers would have used very insightful language which would probably have even asked the crowds to start marching to set house, and they would probably get shot. And this is the kind of thing they wanted. So we deflated them. We refused to fall into their trap. But that isn't... There's no contradiction. That isn't very encouraging, is it, if crowds are marching to state house, that the expectation is that they might get shot? You control the power. Oh, yes. There must be crowd control issues and rules, eh? You cannot allow impunity. You cannot allow them to get away as if there's no government in this country. Yeah, you cannot help me understand allow this, sir. chaos. But help there me understand this. If you're, marching as a crowd, if you're marching as a crowd to State House, expressing your opinion, you should expect to be shot dead? That's exactly what he says. I am saying that the riot... No, 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 no. The riot police make sure <laughs> nobody goes anywhere near State House. State House is a protected security area. And if they want to try and overwhelm the police, the police are liberty to deal with them. Okay, Joseph Semeka, I know you're not satisfied with that. Can let I... me let me take let me fold in your no. response to that with my earlier question. What's your next mm -hmm. step? What are you gonna do next? Mm -hmm. Very well. Let me just quickly, I'm glad that Murada says what he's saying, that if you attempt to protest in this country peacefully and in accordance with the Constitution, their response is to shoot you dead. That's, he just confirmed that. I'm glad he confirms that on television. But listen, if we had wanted to protest, e even in, 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 the, in the presence of the threat of being shot dead, we would still have protested. That was not part of our plan. We know that they withdrew the police because they had brought 5,000 extra police from around Nairobi. They withdrew after getting intelligence the previous night that those police officers, most of them were supporting the people, were supporting what was happening. That's why they pulled back. They were afraid of that. But let me go to what you asked then. What next? <laughs> we go ahead and name a team that, you, that will work with Raila Odinga. We go ahead with the, the people's assemblies that we've been doing around the country. We hold a national convention we force a referendum. So basically what we are doing with the resist, in addition with the, to the resistance activities, is to force to, to usurpers of power to get out of power so that we can have a legitimate process through which we elect our leaders. Okay, so David Murati, what is the likelihood of them getting the referendum that they want? Give me a percentage. Is it zero? Zero. Will... President Kenyatta, David. Okay, so David, will <laughs> President Kenyatta hold out the olive branch and say, okay, listen, Raila Odinga, you're not just some random rebel. You're a former prime minister. I respect you. Come, let's talk. Will he do that? You do not shake hands with somebody with a clenched fist. They have to open the, the palm of their hand so that you can shake hands. But the way they are talking, the way they are intimidating people, the way they are behaving, is like they want to take this thing by force. Nobody's going to sit back and watch them take it by force. So chances of a, a national conversation, yes. Dialogue, we are going to dialogue and have the conversation with the people of Kenya, not with individuals, self-seekers, who are just power hungry. We are going to make sure there is law and order and discipline in this country. 
and let them dare. Okay, well, it seems as if we have two very clear representatives of both sides of the aisle. Joseph, unfortunately, I've got to move on, but yes. I thank you both for joining us, Joseph Simecha and David Murate. Thanks for joining us on the Newsmakers. Hailing from a political family, it seems Hina Rabbani Khar was destined to enter the world of Pakistani politics. At just 25, she was elected to parliament, and less than a decade later, she became the country's youngest and first female foreign minister. During her time in office, Rabbani faced a number of challenges, including a leaked report claiming Pakistan security services were supporting the Taliban in Afghanistan. Of course, Rabbani denied this, but it's an allegation that still haunts the country today. Last week, a Taliban suicide bomber killed more than 100 people in the Afghan capital. And Kabul was quick to accuse Islamabad of providing support to the attackers. But not long after, Pakistan revealed it recently extradited 27 Taliban and Haqqani militants to Afghanistan. So is it now joining the fight against extremism or is this an admission of guilt? Well, for more on this, let's speak to Pakistan's former foreign minister, Hina Rabbani Khar. She joins us from Lahore. It's great to have you on the Newsmakers. Thanks so much for joining us. We've had more carnage in Kabul, and we have Afghanistan and the United States again blaming Pakistan. Are they accurate, or is it unfair? You know, uh, look, uh, the, we all know that the Afghan um, adventure in um, post-9-11 clearly hasn't uh, been able to achieve any of the objectives, whether it was the stated objectives of state building by the Bushira or the objective of ridding this uh, entire region and specifically Afghanistan out from terrorism or terrorism out of Afghanistan of President Obama or the objective, the stated objective of President Trump of being able to healthily and winningly end this war. So for the 17 years of failure, uh, clearly Pakistan offers itself as a good scapegoat because we happen to be a neighbor. Now, I don't want to go into a blame game because I, frankly speaking, am one person who believes that Pakistan is a country whose future is more linked to that of peace and stability in Afghanistan than that of any other country that you're mentioning, mm -hmm. be it our neighbor India, be it your neighbors in your con uh, close to your country, or be it the United States of America, our country's future is linked with stability and peace in Afghanistan more than any other country. So we, our stakes in Afghanistan are much higher than any other countries mm -hmm. because it has a direct effect on the peace and stability of, of Pakistan. Now, let me ask you two simple questions. First of all, if Pakistan is the country which is always blamed for, uh, for uh, sending terrorists, trained terrorists, that's the accusation on Pakistan, something as severe and serious as sending trained terrorists across the border to Afghanistan. Then answer me this question, then why is it that Pakistan is the one which wants to build border posts and ensure that there is only uh, movement of people who have visas, who are secure, people who are uh, enlisted people whose record is there, why are we the ones who are building border posts and the border posts on our side of the border happen to be 1,000 and that or 950 but close to 1,000 and that on the other side only 200. And why is that when Pakistan talks about better border management and better border control, we are not helped by anyone, be it right. the United States of America or the Afghan government. So you know this asks you the question that do we, do these countries simply need Pakistan to be a simple, you know, an easy scapegoat to be able to put all the sort of the weight of the failures mm -hmm. on Pakistan. Pakistan is a country which has suffered immensely because of this. We happen to have 200,000 people, soldiers on that border. We clearly do not need that if what we want is more chaos in Afghanistan. Right. Then why are we having people soldiering it? In fact, in the last many, many years, the movement have been the other way around. So uh, I think it's time that we get out of this blame game mode. This country, Afghanistan, has suffered a lot. My country, Pakistan, has suffered a lot. And this entire region has suffered enough. And I think leaders now, the voices which are coming in from Afghanistan, including that of President Ghani, need to understand that it's time to take control of whatever is happening. It's time to collaborate, to cooperate, to clear ourselves from this menace, which is of mutual which is mutually Understood. killing people on both sides. Understood. So Understood. Ex yeah. extremely important right. to do that. And it's interesting because I've spoken to leadership in the PMLN. 
I've spoken to Imran Khan. I'm speaking to you, a member of the People's Party and former foreign minister. You're all on the same page when it comes to this. You all use the, the, you know, the term scapegoat as well. And that's, that, that's fascinating to hear because there seems to be unity across the political divide on this issue. You asked a couple of questions there, some of them rhetorical. I want to play something from you from the current foreign minister, the man in the seat that you once held, Khawaja Asif. When I spoke mm -hmm. to him in December with regards to the accusations that Pakistan arms and funds groups like the Haqqani Network, this is what he had to say. Have a listen. You know, we, we are not backing them a, at all. This, this is a perception which was uh, perhaps, uh, as I said earlier, perhaps to, to an extent was correct uh, mm -hmm. some five, six, seven years back. But when did it but end? In, when we started our operation against them right. in June 2014. Now, that jumped out at me, and I had to read the transcript afterwards and just be absolutely sure he actually said that. And I asked him to clarify it, and he did as well. So he basically said, yes, we did sort of keep our options open with these groups, but it ended in 2014. I ask you specifically, and I've been looking forward to, to, to asking you this, because you were in office before 2014. So was it happening while you were foreign minister that Pakistan was actually arming and funding groups like the Haqqani Network? No, absolutely. I think this is an entirely irresponsible and factually incorrect uh, statement. I have been on record accepting whatever blame Pakistan, um, you know, not deserves, but what we have to own in terms of our past mistakes, right? Uh, the Pakistan People's Party came into government in 2008, and since then, if you remember, the Malakand operation was the first full-scale military operation that started. It was a turn of events, because before that, people coming from parties like the one Mr. Asif represents, were trying to make peace with the terrorists, with elements which were harming our people. Now, Pakistan People's Party was the only party who had the guts to stand the ground and say, no, this is not a war which has been imposed on us. Yes, it's a war which, has, which, is, which is the factor of many, many international adventures within our region. But right now, it is happening on our soil. Right now, it is killing our people. So we need to take a heavy-handed approach of the state ensuring its writ on its geographical territory. So ill-informed, I would say, and perhaps mm -hmm. not very well-versed with the historical realities of uh, dealing with terrorism and, um, uh, in Pakistan. This has been a long battle. This will continue to be a long battle. And that is why I would extol upon leadership within the region, including Prime Minister Modi, including President Ghani, all of these people to understand that this is a menace which is a threat to all of us collectively, to this entire region. And right. this is perhaps the reason why this region plays host to the largest number of poor people in the world. So why are we, or if not the largest, one of the largest, so why are we, if, if the objective is to blame another country um, and to scapegoat another country, then we can all play this you know, for the next 100 years. The, the same game that we played in the last 70 years can be played for the next 100 years. Right. So I, for one, want all of our countries, including mine. Uh, Pakistan has taken responsibility. Pakistan is ensuring through military operations where we are losing more soldiers than perhaps any other country in the world in this fight. We are in this fight. And I do not understand how a country which is receiving body bags on a daily basis through special operations and other operations on the border area can be blamed to be the cause of this terror. Right, right. Uh, massive rift with the U.S. Some might not say it's massive. I mean, that's debatable, but there's a rift with the U.S. right now. Pakistan seems to be a bit confident about this and thumbing its nose at the U.S. a little. Is it because it has options in China, in Iran, and elsewhere that it can afford to do this, or might this backfire? No, you know, I, I, I refuse to believe this either-or option in foreign policy. Uh, I think the U United States has been a partner to Pakistan, perhaps not a strategic partner, but a partner to Pakistan in many, many ways in the last uh, many decades. Uh, I think it is in our best interest that in the very same way that I mentioned for the region, that the United States of America and Pakistan can work together to align our interests within the region. Because our interest in the region, by our, I mean, that obviously, that of Pakistan, is to ensure that extremism and terrorism becomes, goes to zero, is not reduced, but is eliminated completely. Uh, I'm quite sure that is the same interest that the United States of America shares, right? Now, obviously, having spent trillions of dollars and having not, not only achieved status quo, but seeing a dip uh, in the 
in, in, in the stability within the region, particularly in Afghanistan. Um, you know, again, Pakistan presents, uh, happens to be an easy scapegoat. Now, let me give you an example, you see? Because we hear ad nauseum by the Americans about how the situation in Afghanistan has been improved since they came in. Do you, I think we all know that in the last many months, Americans, whether they're soldiers, diplomats, or aid people, once they land in Kabul, the stretch of two miles from the Kabul airport to the embassy is now done through helicopter. Right. So if we cannot secure two kilometers for Americans to tread upon, to be able to travel in, then how can we talk about securing all of Afghanistan? I think the flaw lies in the policy, because in President Trump's statement, you also saw that he was talking about using the military option once again, and using that as the only option. Mm -hmm. And he talked about how uh, he will perhaps one day look at the option of reconciliation. Now, I ask you, then in the last 17 years, military option has been what has been running this policy. Have we succeeded in that? Now, who are we? So if our future policy is based not on learning lessons from the past or from the failures of the past, but, in, but almost uh, you know, abiding yourself or committing yourself to repeating the mistakes of the past, then clearly Pakistan cannot uh, sort of, uh, you know, look away or, or say that we are uh, completely in uh, agreement on how yes. to deal with this problem. I think we have a view. I think our view is based on our natural uh, appreciation of the fabric of Afghan society of the geographical realities, of the societal realities. I think in some ways we have a more educated view than some of our Western friends. Hina Rabbani Khar, I would love to continue, but I've got to move on. It's been a pleasure having you on The Newsmakers. Thank you very much for joining us. And that's all for this edition of The Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. You can check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe. Next time, Yemen's war intensifies in the south. Will this brutal conflict ever end? Until then, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.